Common Prayer on page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be your kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we now hear a word from sacred scripture. A reading from the second book of Samuel. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, 
and he was loth to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin, you shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. The Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became very ill. The word of the Lord. The psalm will be recited by half verse, breaking at the asterisk. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven. And sins away. Happy are they to whom the Lord imputes no guilt. And in the spirit there is no lie. While I held my tongue, my bones withered away. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My moisture was dried up as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. And did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you created me the yoke of my sin. Therefore all the faithful will make their prayers to you in time of trouble. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like horse or mule, which have no understanding. Who must be fitted with dip and bridle. Or else they will not save you. Great are the tribulations of the wicked. But the mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all who are true of heart. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if, in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. 
and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justifications come through the law, then Christ died for nothing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who was touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterwards, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Cusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them 
out of their resources. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. In the Old Testament reading this morning, King David commits a grave sin. Though given much by God, David turns away from God to follow his own desire. He covets the wife of a soldier named Uriah. He covets to such a degree that he has Uriah murdered so that he can have Bathsheba. Uriah was the ultimate soldier, serving with total loyalty, unwilling to accept any comfort or privilege for himself that the rest of the troops could not share in. Uriah served with selfless devotion. He's the kind of man we would expect might have been made a great king. But we are told God chose David. Clearly, God must choose to work with people's imperfections. After David has known Bathsheba and ordered the murder of Uriah, the prophet Nathan goes to David and tells him the story of a poor man with a ewe lamb. The man's lamb, which is like a child to him, and one of the few possessions that he has, is taken by a rich man who doesn't want to kill an animal from his own large flock to fulfill the custom of hospitality for a traveler. He's willing to fulfill his culture-bound duty as long as there is no cost to himself. So. He steals from the poor man instead. <clears throat> David responds in great anger when the prophet finishes the story and asks what should be done to the man. King David declares that the man should be put to death for what he has done. But then Nathan speaks the sharp point of the story. David is that man. David has stolen not a lamb, but a man's wife, and not only the wife, but has taken the very life of the husband as well. It is indeed a moment of humiliation and shame for David, as he recognizes that Nathan has spoken truth to him. David confesses and repents. We learn that God has already put away, that is forgiven, David's sin. Yet there will be terrible consequences resulting from it, and they will, be, they will be deeply painful and cause tremendous grief. God calls us to obedience for the purpose of our own well-being, not for some arbitrary whim of God. God, having put away David's sin, will not kill David, as David had declared appropriate for the man in the story. But David's actions have set in motion something that will bring him suffering. Bathsheba will give birth to a child, and the child will die. Scorning God leads to bad things, not because God is wrathful or revengeful, but rather as the direct consequence of the wrongdoing. In the Gospel reading, we see, in the words of New Testament scholar Kenneth Bailey, the costly demonstration of unexpected love. The cost is to God. The costly demonstration of unexpected or undeserved love. 
which is the forgiveness demonstrated by God. More specifically in this story, by God incarnate, Jesus. The writer, St. Luke, paints the scene of the dinner party beautifully. Jesus is invited to the home of a Pharisee, and he accepts the invitation. The table itself would have been set up in kind of a squared off U shape. There would be couches all along the, the table where people would recline to eat. They didn't sit in those days, they reclined. Their feet would be up on the couch. It would not have been unusual for people to come in off the street and to line up, sit along the walls behind the guests. And when the dinner was over and the guests had all finished eating and gotten up, those people could move forward to the table and eat. Remember, in those days, there was no Cornerstone Mission meal. There was no Feeding South Dakota. There was no senior meal program. So the woman in the story would have entered the room with no one taking notice of her being there. When an invited guest arrived, and certainly all the more so for a rabbi or teacher, as the Pharisee addressed Jesus, the host would place his hands on the guest's shoulders and give him the kiss of peace. And then the host would have water and a towel brought out to wash and refresh the guest's feet. And when that was done, then oil would be poured over the guest's head. None of these were provided for Jesus. Now we have to understand how important hospitality was in that culture. And honor was the most valued thing that a man could have. Jesus can surely see right from the start, by his unusual reception, that he has been invited there to be shamed. The woman in our story is a person who knows about humiliation and shame firsthand. It's fairly clear that her line of work is prostitution. But before we judge her too harshly, let us remember that there were no social services for a woman who had no husband or father or son to protect her, shelter her, and feed her. The woman in this story is known in the local community as a sinner. And if anyone had any doubts, she confirms that when she lets her hair down. No decent woman in the first century Mediterranean culture would have been seen in public with her hair down. Only her husband in the privacy of their home would see her hair loose. Obviously, they didn't have the same style I do. <laughs> Having her hair down in this setting at the Pharisee's house would be something like walking into a dinner party wearing the emperor's new clothes. <laughs> I see some of you have read the book. <laughs> For those not familiar with the story, the emperor was wearing no clothes. <clears throat> that was one of my favorite books when I was six or seven years old. In fact, I liked it so much I forgot to take it back to the library. And when it came time to move, I found it on my bookshelf. <laughs> but I did return it. Now, if you haven't read the book, um, please don't make any judgments about what I was reading at age <laughs> six or seven. The story teaches a valuable point. But to get back to our story here, as Jesus is lying on the couch at the table, the woman who had heard Jesus preaching had heard his preaching of his mercy, God's mercy, and had experienced forgiveness through Jesus, is overcome by compassion for him as she sees him being thoroughly humiliated in front of this room full of people. She decides to stand in solidarity with Jesus. 
In spite of her many sins, on this night she demonstrated the purity of heart that we have heard Jesus preach about in the Beatitudes. In this woman, we see one who incarnates the words of St. Paul in today's epistle reading. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So what does she do? She offers the courtesies that everyone knows the host blatantly denied to Jesus. She moves across the room and kneels down behind him at his feet. She's so moved by the shameful treatment that he's been given, she begins to cry. And she cries enough tears to wash his feet. And since the host has provided no towel, she uses her hair to wipe his feet. You can almost sense the tension that would have been in the room at this point, can't you? As everyone waits to see how Jesus will respond, will he give her a good hard kick with his feet? Will he shout at her and then explain to the others that he is as offended by her actions, her scandalous behavior as they are? Jesus does neither. And now she proceeds to take the alabaster jar of perfumed ointment from around her neck. And she pours the costly contents on Jesus' feet. Everyone in the room is in stunned silence. The Pharisee is thinking to himself, some prophet this Jesus is, he can't even recognize this woman who's touching him, touching him with her hair as the sinful woman she is. And then Jesus breaks the silence. Simon, I have something to say to you. The phrase carries the connotation that Jesus is about to say something critical or harsh. Jesus proceeds to tell a parable about a creditor who canceled the debts of two people, one who owed a great debt and the other a smaller one. Jesus asked Simon, which will love the creditor more? Simon rightly answered that it is the one who had the larger debt forgiven. Jesus responds to Simon the Pharisee that he is correct. And of course, that debtor represents the woman in our gospel story. Therefore, I tell you, says Jesus, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Simon. Note here that the woman's response of love follows the forgiveness. She's not seeking to earn forgiveness. She's responding out of gratitude. Jesus then points out to Simon that the normal welcome required by the culture has not been given to him on his arrival. Simon, the one who owed the smaller debt, is the one who should be feeling shame. Jesus points out that the woman has offered him the three courtesies that Simon denied him. The woman has honored Jesus, and she has done so at a cost to herself. When I took communion to Barry Johnson last Sunday, his son Chris had Barry's two granddaughters there. Barry was so focused on those two little girls he could not take his eyes off of them. He kept reaching out his hand, and they would put their hand in his, and he would rub their shoulder. And the love that he felt for those two little girls 
was just palpable in that room. And so I think it was for the woman in this gospel story. Her gratitude for the forgiveness she had received from Jesus brought her to focus totally on Jesus. She was to the point now she was not aware of anybody else in the room. Her absolute focus was on Jesus. And that gave her the courage and the peace to stand in solidarity with him in that inhospitable environment. The collect we earlier prayed clearly seeks us to direct our focus and our heart on God. The word your, referring to God, is said five times in that short prayer. Hear it again. Keep, O Lord, your household in the church, your household, the church, in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ. That repetition of the word your reminds us who and whose we are. It reminds us that it is through God's grace that we are able to proclaim with boldness God's truth and administer justice with compassion, God's justice, for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. And thanks be to God for the courageous testimony and the focused witness of the woman in this morning's gospel story. May we be open to receive the forgiveness God offers us and to remain so focused on Jesus that by the grace of God, we may proclaim God's truth with boldness and minister God's justice with compassion in the coming week and every day of our life. Amen. steadfast faith and belief in the power of God's forgiveness and mercy, let us stand, turning to page 358, and let us pray that ancient prayer we have inherited. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten from not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And
and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please turn to Form 4 of the Prayers of the People, found on page 388. Let us pray for the church and the world. <clears throat> Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Father, we are ever mindful of those who go without this day in the oppressive heat. We ask that you care for them, comfort them, and under your wings shadow them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Father, we pray for all travelers who are visiting with us. We pray for the safety of their travels, that they may reach their destination and return home in health, happiness, and holiness. We ask also, Lord God, that you continue to bestow your abundant blessings upon the people of St. Andrew's Episcopal Church as they seek a new rector. Send to them a shepherd, a priest, a pastor, whom you have ordained and blessed for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, especially remembering this day, Peter, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you have mercy on those who were killed in Orlando last night. We ask, Lord God, that you send a spirit of peace and comfort upon those who mourn and grieve. We ask that you bless our world. Unite us in a spirit of love. Heal us where we are fractured and broken. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
turning back to page 360, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's such a delight to have you here with us. We welcome especially our visitors and guests. We have some folks from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Welcome. We have some folks here from Paris, Texas. Welcome to them also. Uh, Although the folks from Texas, you you surely are welcome to take this heat back home with you. Uh, I'm not blaming you for the heat. I'm just saying this isn't natural in the Black Hills. So uh, it had to come from somewhere. Thank you so much for choosing to worship with us this morning. I hope after our Eucharistic celebration, you'll feel invited and welcome to come to our parish hall where we'll share some uh, uh, coffee. If you prefer, we can put ice in it. Um, Coffee, treats, and things like that. So thank you for being with us. Um, There was no adult forum today. Sister Lorraine Coffin started her series last week. Uh, She will resume it next week. Our adult forums are always between our two services. And uh, Sister Lorraine is a Catholic nun at the Benedictine Monastery, uh, St. Martin Monastery. Um, Many of you know already, because I've spoken about it, that there are Benedictine monasteries within the Episcopal Church. And so we wanted to learn more about the rule and life of St. Benedict and the history of monasticism and convents and things of that nature. Um, We had a great turnout last week. I really hope and pray that you'll come and join us so that we can show Sister Lorraine uh, a warm and hospitable welcome and greeting uh, next week. I want to thank all of you for your prayerful support for me and for Allison and for the girls as we attended Young Life Camp uh, earlier this week. Uh, We left last Sunday. We got back yesterday. Uh, In fact, speaking of the heat, so we left Denver, not Denver, we left uh, right outside of Winter Park, Colorado. It was 37 degrees yesterday morning when we left. When we pulled into our driveway, it was 102. Something's not right. This Young Life Camp was a phenomenal experience for both me and for Allison um, and for the girls as well. It's still taking me a little time, I think, to process everything that we witnessed and experienced. Um, What an incredible organization and what an incredible way in which they draw people, young people, into the life of Jesus Christ. So uh, I commend to you prayers for the success of the future Young Life Camps that are to be held this year. On Tuesday at 1230, we'll be meeting at the Feeding South Dakota Food Bank to fill backpacks. If you have some time, please come and join us and serve. Uh, There are young children who get their lunch and their breakfast at school. Well, what happens in the summer when they don't have school? Well, a lot of them have empty cupboards. And so if you can sign up outside uh, in the hallway, 
uh, to join us. It will go much more quickly, and it's a wonderful way to be of service. It's not, um, it's not labor-intensive. It doesn't take a lot of physical dexterity. So really, anyone at any level or ability can come and help. We would love to have you there with us. So please sign up. Uh, Deacon Virginia prayed for the repose of the soul of Peter. Pete and Peter Anderson is uh, a Rapid Cityan that many of you probably know. Uh, Peter and his wife occasionally worship here with us at Emmanuel. Peter was raised Episcopalian, his wife Roman Catholic, and so they kind of traded off showing their children the various traditions in which they were raised. Um, Pete is in the late 40s uh, and was bicycling yesterday and uh, died rather unexpectedly. Um, he has five young children. I ask that you pray for Pete. I also ask that you pray uh, for the group of bicyclists um, who found Pete. Um, they are still struggling a bit themselves. Uh, they were angels sent by God in many ways and gave, I think, gave Pete some comfort in his last moments. Uh, but that's a heavy burden to carry on, on a person's shoulders. So I ask that you pray for those individuals as well. Um, there is a new addition to our parlor, I just discovered this morning myself, uh, while I was away, uh, a TV monitor was placed in there, and so, you know my rule, you know I love kids, and you know I want kids in the church, so I'm not suggesting this to get rid of kids out of the church, I want children in the church, they don't bother me, cries, wails don't bother me, but... If there's anyone who feels a little self-conscious um, and wants a place to go, you can now go into the parlor and watch the service as it's being videoed and live streamed in the parlor. So don't leave on my account, but if you feel like you need to or must, um, that is an option for you. Um, finally, this Eucharist today is a special celebration for Allison and for me and our family. Uh, today would have been Allison's grandfather's 100th birthday. And um, uh, that's just a phenomenal thing. He, he's been gone now for a number of years, uh, but he was a powerful force in Allison's family. And because I grew up with Allison, I knew him too. And so he was somewhat of a powerful force in my life as well. Um, I have my mother-in-law, in fact, in Louisiana. Hi, live streaming, watching us. Um, <laughs> hi again. <laughs> so um, um, I just wanted to note uh, this uh, uh, very important day in the life of our family as we remember Allison's grandfather, Les Boudreaux. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
we received the gifts you so generously offered from your hearts, uh, that those who would like to come forward for a special blessing may come following our ushers. Heavenly Father, we return these gifts to you, which you first gave unto us. Bless them and make them holy, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Come on up. So we just kind of gather around here, and I'll go around. I already have a hint about some of our new friends from Paris, Texas. I'll tell you about that in just a moment. And Joanne shared with me. Uh, Joanne and Dwight had a great-grandchild born this week, right? Uh, so we're going to pray in Thanksgiving. Oh, tell me the baby's name again. Brooks. And what is the mama's name? Alicia. So let us pray for baby and mother. Heavenly Father, you saw it fit to come into the world as an infant child born to a woman. We ask, Lord God, that you bless Brooks and Alicia. We ask, Lord God, that you make them healthy, holy, and happy this day and all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For humility to go with Eli. For humility to go with Eli. <laughs> Got it. Heavenly Father, your Son, Jesus Christ, humbled himself to the point of death on the cross. And so we ask that through those wounds, healing may be in abundance, just as humility may be poured out. We ask this through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that the travels of Lynn, her son and daughter-in-law, be made holy, that they return home in safety and security to us, and the lives which they go to celebrate may be embedded in their hearts with memories of great joy and happiness, and may be bonded more deeply in the mystery of your love. We ask this through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. So remind me your names again, forgive me. Marilyn and Robert Thornborough, and you all were married in this church 50 years ago. When? 50 years ago? Actually, it was December, but we thought we'd come back in June. December. You know, believe it or not, December, I think it was 78 degrees. <laughs> and uh, Father King, I believe you said, Hannaford King did your, did your wedding, right? Oh, what a great blessing. My parents celebrate their 50th anniversary in a couple of weeks. I'll be going to Louisiana, your neighboring state, to celebrate their 50th anniversary. So let's hold hands and let's do an anniversary blessing. Oh God, you have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it has represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Send therefore your blessing upon these your servants that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You need something. Not sure what. Okay, that works. Ah, well, thank you, Miranda. I appreciate that. Come, Holy Spirit. You know the prayers that Miranda has in her heart, in her mind, in her soul, even before she knows them herself. Here you're a daughter who is seeking, who is asking, and who is knocking. Reveal yourself to her, Lord God. Open the door wide and answer her call. We ask this through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Traveling to Denver. Yes. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Fantastic. Are you excited, Bruce? Good, I'm kind of excited too. Can I go with you? No? Sorry. <laughs> Apology accepted. <laughs> oh God, our Heavenly Father, whose glory fills the whole creation and in whose presence we find wherever we go, preserve those who travel, surround them with your loving care, protect them from every danger, and bring them in safety to their journey's end. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Anniversary, fantastic. O oh God, you have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it is represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Send therefore your blessing upon these your servants, that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Is it your 50th? <laughs> uh, Sure. Oh, goodness. Absolutely. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of Rebecca's graduation and for the opportunity for her family to travel. Bring peace to her heart. Assure her, Lord God, of their safety and security. And may they come with great joy and love. And may they return home in safety. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Lord, wash away my iniquities, cleanse me of my sins. Our Eucharist continues in the Book of Common Prayer on page 361. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. This is my blood of the new covenant, 
which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the peace. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. In the Episcopal Church, of course, all baptized Christians, regardless of denomination, are welcomed, invited, and encouraged to share with us in Holy Communion, Holy Eucharist this day. Uh, if you prefer a blessing, you may hold your arms. I'll be happy to bless you and pray over you. We also have gluten-free hosts available today. If that's part of your need, please let me know when I get to you. body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
Our post-communion prayer can be found on page 365. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve thee with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our
prayer shawl ministry continues to thrive. Uh, Laura Orville dropped some off earlier today, and I, I apologize, Laura, I didn't bless them earlier, but I'll catch you now if that's okay. Heavenly Father, we ask that all those who are comforted by these prayer shawls may feel the warmth and fire of your love. We ask that you bless these and those who com are comforted by them, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 And now, the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you today and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.